<laughs> True Americana, baby. This song, Ted Nugent's fight for the Second Amendment, are the rights, and the info war. Match made in heaven. Here we come now. It's amazing Texas Ranch, and I feel like I'm following the white rabbit down the rabbit hole. There he is right up ahead of us. It's good to be in America. It's good to be in Texas. It's good to have the Second Amendment, even though these bastards are trying to steal our damn birthright. We're going to win. We're going to stand up. They're not going to stop us. Thanks to folks like Ted Nugent and all of you out there. We have the right to keep and bear arms, not just the king. The people, we the people have the right to keep and bear arms. If you try to take it away from us, we'll shoot you. I'm, a, I'm kind of hesitant to even share this information, but once again, information is knowledge. Knowledge is power. Power is the capability of correcting wrong. I'm usually dead on with a bow, but I'm actually sweating because Ted Nugent's watching. <laughs> My name is Ted Nugent. I'm entering my 70th rock and roll year of the American dream, my 70th hunting season. I got 14 grandkids and seven wonderful kids and the most beautiful, dangerous wife in the world, the greatest hunting dogs in the world. I have machine guns and everything I want in life, the best sounding band, the best grinding rhythm and blues rock and roll band in the world. We have reached critical mass and I'm loving every greasy, gory rhythm and blues Motown minute of it. Yeah! yeah! The people who hate me are hating because I'm so happy. All right, folks, inside Ted Nugent's awesome ranch with his great wife and family, this is America. This is the heart of 1776. So everybody want coffee? Sure, we love some. All right, here's some good fucking Nugent Java. And I'm not kidding, this isn't the Tom Petty coffee. My coffee is the only coffee that's ballistically coefficient. <laughs> I like a good cup of joe, man. News coffee shit, brought man. to you by Stay On Point. Now, take a slug of that, Jones. Yes, sir. Some serious stuff. Starbucks can kiss my dead dog's left nut. Oh, and here's the boss. Now man, that is rich. Hey, wow. how are you? Hey, it's awesome to meet you. I talked to you before on the phone, but it's good to see you in person. Yeah. Thanks for having us at your home. Yeah, thanks for being here. Thank you. Glad to finally meet you. Live it up, boys. You're welcome. You're in a, you're in a, a hospitable environment here. And don't give me this polite bullshit. Once I let you on my ranch, you're my friends. Right. Believe me, as, and as friendly as I am, I'm prepared to kill each other. <laughs> and I think the most important thing we can say, if I do say so myself, and I just happen to know what that most important thing is, before we get into the disaster that surrounds us, the dishonesty, the political. We should crisis. celebrate the good stuff. There are so many great Americans out there that get Thanks, up sir. early and bust their ass and live by the truth, logic, and common sense that we celebrate and promote. It is alive and well across this country. And here's to them. It, it, at the feed mill, at the at the hardware store, at the grocery store, at the coffee shop at the schools, at the churches, everywhere I go. It's like truth, logic, and common sense. Second Amendment absolutist, earning your own way, saving for a rainy day, giving to the needy instead of expecting Uncle Sam to take care of them. So what you and I live by is not rare. It is approaching ubiquity across this country. And they're trying to steal it because they're desperate and know that they've lost the culture war. They really have. And, and academia, media, what the hell? The government itself in Hollywood, in my 70 years of clean and sober radaring my world around me, I watched the dumbing down of America manifest itself in all things liberal, Democrat, rhino, anti-constitutional infringement, oath violation that is running amok. But in spite of that, I'm living the American dream every day. I hunt, I fish, I shoot, I make music, I tour, I do charity work, I hang with working hard, playing hard Americans. So the positive spirit is still soaring across this country. Well, I gotta tell you, I know you did thousands of interviews during the election and everybody gets credit, but if you hadn't worked your ass off so hard, I don't know if Trump would've got in. I, I don't remember sleeping <laughs> in 2016. What I did is I focused on the, they call
called Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, the reliably blue states, every time they report it. What a, what a nasty thing to say. The reliably blue states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. So I focus my attention on those three states and I wallpaper and carpet bomb the media, scolding the conservatives, the licensed hunters of those states, 800,000 per state. And I scolded them that they didn't vote for McCain and Romney. You can't blame them really because McCain and Romney didn't represent anything that we believe in. But by not voting for McCain and Romney, they gave it to Barack Obama. And, I, and they get all the judges. And I went really, yeah, I went really nuts on them. And I didn't do it alone, but that was the driving force in those reliably blue hell zones. Because those states are not reliably blue. In fact, it's important to know and talk about the positive. You look at a map of America, a political map, and it's just red as can be, except for the little blue high crime smudges of liberal Democrat insanity, where liberal Democrats have literally brainwashed people to think that they don't have to earn their own way and that self-defense is not desirable and unarmed helplessness in gun-free zones will somehow keep us safe. And if you think about it, those, those little cancer spots across the red-blooded map know that their time is running out. They admit that. My, my favorite thing is not that you and I and everybody I know agree with logic, truth, and common sense. My favorite thing is watching liberals and Democrats attempt their, to make their points on television and not knowing how stupid they look. They are the masters of shooting themselves in the foot. So if you and I were to have a, a date with God, which by the way, I think we do, and we said, God, could you design our foil? Could you design someone who could actually look so obnoxious and rude and, and dishonest and unkempt to counter what we believe in? He'd go, I already did. His name is Michael Moore. Exactly. Or Nancy Pelosi. Or Hillary Clinton. Or Hillary Clinton, or Barack Obama, or Eric Holder, Chucky or Reverend Schumer. Lynch. My favorite is, I think the Democrats, when they put forth the Pelosi's and the Boxers, and especially the Maxine Waters and the Sheila Jackson Lees, that struggle to form syllables, I couldn't have gone to central casting and go, could you create a big dirt bag to represent the Or other the side. guy from Georgia that thinks islands float. Yeah, perfect, exactly. Let him talk. Give him the microphone. My fear is that uh, the whole island will uh, become so overly populated that it will tip over and, uh, and capsize. Sacred as the Second Amendment is, the First Amendment is not important because we can say what we want. It's because idiots can say what they want, so the rest of us can go, Gosh, that's an idiot. So I think we're in a good place right now. And uh, I think the fact that the left is so brain dead and comfortably numb with political correctness and fake news and dishonesty, that they're doing a better job than we are. No, I agree. But, but uh, since, since we're here getting the Second Amendment, we're seeing right now the biggest purge online of it conservative sites, veteran sites, gun sites, shooting clubs, uh, Christian sites. I've never seen such a person. Oh, I've been, I've been thrown off. I won't mention any names now in hopes that the negotiations can continue and move forward on a, an honest level. But I have been thrown out by the biggest promoters in the world because I'm on the board of the NRA. And I promise you, if I was recently arrested for heroin distribution, they would have not thrown me off. The exactly. Coast. But because I'm on the board of a, the family grassroots organization of the National Rifle Association that stands for self-defense, I've been thrown off tens of millions of dollars in revenue. Look at all the, the claims that I'm a child molester, a draft dodger, that I diss the Native Americans. It's all lies. Oh, I know. What nasty things, especially my relationship with the Native Americans. I have been invited to almost every Native American tribe to teach their children the Native lifestyle of clean and sober, hands-on conservation, self-sufficiency, hunting, fishing, outdoor conservation shared sweat lodges with their spiritual leaders since the 60s. I have been given felonious eagle feather war bonnets by the elders of numerous tribes because I, in my song Great White Buffalo and in my promotion of conservation, especially bow hunting, they feel a kinship, a blood brotherhood there with me. So meanwhile, the Native Americans and I are spiritual blood brothers, so the Huffington Post claims that I called them unclean vermin. 
and then some people actually fell for it. So uh, it, it, you can see that as I say these things, as nasty and horrific and dishonest as they are, you notice I'm still smiling. It, it is a panicked purge because I agree with you. They know that culturally they've lost the soul of America. I mean, you go to the Rolling Stone articles attacking you and I this week. It's they'll hysterical. Get, they'll get one or two comments. Your site has thousands per story, so does mine, and 50 times the traffic. That's what I'm saying. You're right. They have had a cardiac arrest. They're falling apart. But I don't want to underestimate their counter -offensive. No, no, we don't. We did. doesn't mean that we get complacent by any stretch of the imagination. I think political correctness has backfired, and even though fake news and the orchestrated lies of the media starting in the late 60s quite honestly some people fell for it but then when they really tune in and pay attention they see how dishonest it is and my backing and my support is at an all-time high right now Ours too. I, I couldn't be more I couldn't be more proud that's what I that's why I mentioned the good honest smart intelligent hands-on asset column Americans well, those exactly. are my blood brothers I want to be clear I'm not trying to like do propaganda for the enemy and say boy they're powerful I'm saying they have proven that they are totally and completely ruthless and Apple is moving to China it's hateful Apple is moving to China and is going to hire the Chinese government to actually oversee internet censorship Wait. worldwide and, and Ted it gets worse they just removed Easter off the I Apple saw calendar it. and when they contacted them, Apple said yeah we did do that I mean, this is just, I mean. And the Southern Poverty Law Center is now in charge of censorship in social media. The Southern Poverty Law Center, one of the worst racist hate groups in the history of the world. And everybody knows it except the comfortably numb stoners who just hate freedom and hate the Constitution and hate hardworking people because they, you know, I deserve, I deserve to have my college tuition waived. <laughs> Bunch of dirtbags. I mean, you look at the average Ted Nugent hater, and I couldn't be more proud. I'm more proud of that than the great people that I connect with. Growing up, it's like I didn't have to have Twilight Zone or Mad Magazine or One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or The Planet of the Apes or Clockwork Orange. I got the media, academia, Hollywood, and half of our government to keep me entertained. Uh, but even as I chuckle stating these things, because you have to laugh or you'll, you'll cry, if I didn't believe that conservative values, basic constitutional bill of rights, golden rule, Ten Commandments, common sense was alive and well, I, I'm not even going to say publicly what I would do, but you know damn well what I would do. But I believe that that positive force is going to win in the end, and that we are winning incrementally every day, even though the media is in their scramble to dishonestly create fake news as representing otherwise i believe the positive spirit is as strong as it's ever been and because the spirit's coming back it makes it that much more important don't you feel that we've got to fight and win and to realize what we're up against because we've really drawn out the other side to show their true america hating evil their true prosperity hating evil and then i ask why do they love communism? Why do they love collapse? Be why careful they... asking those questions. I have people ask me, well, why would they want to ban this bullet or this? And I don't go down the why road. If you start asking why, why does a woman who gets up there and says, you don't need to read this, you need to sign it to find out what's in it. I mean, why wasn't she tackled on the House floor and handcuffed and, and given some sort of treatment? Uh, you Don't ask why. Just know that evil, dishonesty, and scam artists have always been around and that right now they're liberal, they're Democrat, they're rhinos, they're Hollywood, they're fake news, they're media, they're academia, and they're half of our government, at least. So come to that realization. There are rabid coyotes running around. You don't wait till you see one to go get your gun. Keep your gun handy, and every time you see one, you shoot one. They're trying to conquer us. I can feel their will. I can see it. They're control freaks. So for me, it's such an animating contest just to get them off my back. Well, and that's why they hate me so much, because I'm uncontrollable. And in all this observation of the good, the bad, and the ugly, it's important to note that my name is Ted Nugent. I'm entering my 70th rock and roll year of the American dream, my 70th hunting season. I got 14 grandkids and seven wonderful kids, and the most beautiful, dangerous wife in the world, the greatest hunting dogs in the world. I have machine guns and everything I want in life, the best sounding band, the best grinding rhythm and blues rock and roll band in the world. But there's the most important thing I can say is there's only one thing more dangerous than a sow grizzly bear with cubs nearby. And that's Ted Nugent with more confidence. We have reached critical mass, and I'm loving every greasy, gory rhythm and blues Motown minute of it.
When all hell breaks loose, I go back to the sanctity of perfection. <laughs> Not only do I want to make America great again, I want to make America healthy again. So I, that's one of the things that I'm working on. We can't control everything that's going on right now, but we can control how we're feeling and how we're exercising and, and living our daily lives. And we're not perfect. Ted and I eat kind of whatever we want, but 80% of what we eat is pure, lean protein, venison, lots of veggies. But you've got to take care of yourself. Who wants to stand in line waiting for the doctors, going to the hospital? Not me. <laughs> so I'm going to take care of myself. Where Shemaine has a Queen of the Forest segment on our Spirit of the Wild show. It's been the number one show for 28 years on Outdoor Channel. I can't imagine why. <laughs> and, and her Queen of the Forest is a, a reach out. It's educate. Well, I started it because I wasn't raised in a hunting family. My dad didn't hunt. I never had been around Never guns. touched a gun until she met me. Or, she rock, grabbed mine. or rock and roll, but that's another story. So I was basically baptized it. by fire walking into Ted's world and I realized, wow, I'm, I'm actually a tomboy at heart. I like to, I used to race motocross. She I was a to, motocross champion. Yes, I, I love getting my hands dirty and I love being outdoors. So this really fit in with my lifestyle, the hunting outdoor adventure lifestyle. But I realized there's a lot of women, what if they never had that opportunity to be exposed to hunting or guns? How would they feel? So I, I took women who hunt, women who don't hunt, I paired them together, be, and I let them sit in a tree stand and watch nature unfold. Because if you've never hunted, how can you have an opinion about it? If you've never shot a gun, how can you have it's an opinion about it? It's a form of relaxation and meditation, isn't yes. it? Healing powers of nature. And 100% yes. of the non-hunting women fell in love with it. Many of them were either already anti-hunting or inclined to be anti-hunting with the propaganda. They're cowards because they murder defenseless animals until they realize that it's about conservation, wise use, balancing of wildlife. And each and every one of them were changed by yes. that. And, and we do it all the time. You remember when I had Anthony Bourdain out here, he was a liberal left-wing anti-gun zealot from Manhattan. Within 15 minutes of him shooting some of my guns, he went, this is so much fun, I can't believe it. The shit-eating grin he had on his face is inescapable. I've done that with thousands of people. I have literally eliminated the brainwashing of thousands of people just by honestly articulating the joys of aim small, miss small, marksmanship, the mystical flight of the arrow and the healing powers of nature. And the most dramatic and profound example is my 50 year old son, Fleetwood, Theodore Fleetwood Nugent, who I put up for adoption in 1968 and we got back together when he was 42. Raised in New York City, surrounded by liberal propaganda all his life, voted for Barack Obama, and I sat down, it was a re an emotional reunion. So here we have the poster child of liberal indoctrination, and he <laughs> discovered that Ted Nugent was his dad, so <laughs> once he came out of that vortex of culture shock, which only lasted a couple of minutes because I hugged him, we cried, we celebrated our lost time and how we're gonna be dedicated to make up for it, father, son of blood and spirit, and not Five minutes later, I completely reversed his anti-gun brainwashing. I completely reversed his anti-conservative liberal policies because he owns three restaurants and I explained to him why all those regulations destroy his bottom line. And you could see he would wince a bit, furrow his brow and go, boy, dad, I, I never thought of it like that. We took him to the firing range and I said, there's a tool. Handle it with care, and conscious, conscientiously. And he fell in love with the shooting sports, fell in love with hunting. So I promise with sincere, genuine articulation, you can eliminate the liberal brainwashing of any age, a kid, a grown man, an old man, an old woman, with just a few moments of articulating why it's wrong, the evidence that is unlimited evidence to prove that liberal policies destroy everything, and the unlimited evidence that the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, and a work ethic is the only path to quality of life. The truth will 
metastasize. The truth will spread the more we can get our side, conservatives, people in the asset column, people who work for a living, people who believe in the self-evident truth in our founding documents. They are with us. But the dumbing down of America didn't just hit leftists, it's hit the conservatives as well. And there's a lot of knee-jerk overreaction going on. And the minute Donald Trump even invites someone from the other side, a lot of our friends will go, why is he even dealing with those people? He should never talk to those people. Well, that's not how you get things done. And I know how he operates. There's a term, and I'll give it to you, and you can beep it whatever you want. But what drives the American dream and quality of life are shit kickers. People who bust their ass to be in the asset column, make sacrifices and take risks, entrepreneurs, welders and carpenters, and hardworking ranchers and farmers, and guitar players, and people that know they have to be productive. That's what makes America great every day, always has, always will. But a lot of our side will get angry the minute you even give a nod to the other side, and you have to give a nod to the other side, so it encourages them to speak up, to expose their dishonesty and their horrible agenda. President Trump is the ultimate shit kicker. He is a strategist. You can't build an empire like that if you don't meet with all concerns and get them comfortable and get them to believe that you are listening to their points of view, no matter how absurd it is, so it knocks down their guard. Now, I'm not going to get any more detail than that, but all I can tell you is that when Donald Trump meets with maniacs like Dianne Feinstein, who will not let her constituents carry a gun while she has a 38 in her purse, a king, a tyrant does that. That's why we wrote down after we shot the British at Concord Bridge that we can say what we want to say, we can choose our religion, we're going to have a media that was supposed to monitor the government. We have the right to keep and bear arms, not just the king, the people. We the people have the right to keep and bear arms. If you try to take it away from us, we'll shoot you. We're not slaves. We're not slaves. We're not subject. We're free citizens. It was a brand new hallelujah experiment in self-government. And so it my works, and everybody wants to come here, and now the left wants to blow it up. Well, here's the perfect thing. So you say, America first, and Democrats hate you. So who is first if not America, you dirtbag? And they claim it's a Russian plot to make America great again. <laughs> Well, the media has lied about me since the 1960s because I'm a hunter and I'm a gun advocate. And more and more people are waking up and getting wiser every day and they're realizing what this fake news thing is all about. That's why Donald Trump is such an important guy because he finally put the spotlight on the fake news cockroaches. And people are getting smarter all the time and there's more and more support for truth, logic, and common sense. We celebrate it every damn day. Most of the 
dirt bags on the left hate me because I'm so damn happy. I mean, I come out here and I got all these bows and arrows. I literally come out here every day and I take a pink arrow with my name on it. And I come out here with Shemaine and we shoot our bows every day. We, we go to the range a lot. If you don't do it, you can learn something from Ted Nugent. It is the following. Get yourself a bow and arrow. And when you are looking at your target and you're preparing to draw your bow, it goes all the way back to the origins of Zen. And the mystical flight of the arrow right here tunes out everything liberal, everything democratic, and you become the path of your arrow of life. I just hit the booger I was aiming at. Look out, there's Alex in the hole. And it's real touchy trigger, real touchy. I understand. Get that top pin in that top peep. And sweet, nicely done. I'm usually dead on with a bow, but I'm actually sweating because Ted Nugent's right. watching. Yeah. It's like guitars, women, and guns, man. It's got to be fit for you. All right, let's see. Okay. And just oh, yeah, this is better. Zero but... that in there and just squeeze that some bitch. There you go. Double lungs, brother. All right, good. Back strap, Ted Nugent. I've studied Columbine, Virginia Tech, San Bernardino, Sandy Hook. I've studied Aurora. I've studied the Pulse nightclub. And I've studied all these mass slaughters. In every one of those instances, there were good Americans who would have been armed and capable of stopping the shooter, but law forbid them to be armed and prepared. When I finally realized what was occurring, I thought, I got him. And I reached for my purse. He was maybe 12 feet away. You know, is it possible my gun could have jammed? Sure. Is it possible I could have missed? Sure. But I can tell you I've hit much smaller targets at much greater distances. But then I realized that a couple of months earlier I had made the stupidest decision of my life. I took my gun out of my purse and left it in my car. Because as you well know, in the state of Texas, it's sometimes a felony offense to carry a gun in your purse. And in San Bernardino, in that building, there were Americans in California that would have carried a gun and could have responded to the shooter if they were allowed to by law. In the Pulse nightclub, in Sandy Hook, in Virginia Tech, in Columbine, there were people that would have been armed. They were unarmed and helpless because the law forced them to be unarmed and helpless. As I mentioned, I'm not really mad at the guy that did this. And I'm certainly not mad at the guns that did this. They didn't walk in there by themselves and pull their own triggers. The guy that did it was a, a, a lunatic. That's like being mad at a, a rabid dog. I'm mad at my legislators for legislating me out of the right to protect myself and my family. Now, myself, I've never been in a gun-free zone. Because as soon as I arrive, it fails to be one. Um, but unarmed and helplessness is a self-inflicted curse and an a intellectually dishonest, if not vacuous, choice to be a victim. So all we have to do is uh, reverse the great society and the New Deal zombies of the liberal Democrat scourge and started in the 50s and 60s and teach people that unarmed and helpless is dangerous and asking for trouble. You know what the problem today is though, there are a lot of people, especially uh, women, in, in my situation, I wasn't born and raised in a hunting family or surrounded by guns in my family. So. Had I not married you, I don't know how I would have thought. And, and I you have, wouldn't have I, been very happy. I would not have been happy at all. <laughs> no venison. Yes. No sadie but or happy. I do have a lot of friends that I, I find myself educating them about gun ownership. And they're, they're ignorant about what it really takes. And, it's, and I, I mentioned to them, every time I've been around you and your teenage girls, I've been armed and I'm not dangerous. <laughs> so it's interesting that I think the, the problem now is that we have to educate people who really have, have no idea what to do. And they're scared and they get misinformation. They hear about big, you know, ARs and assault weapons. And, you know, I could assault you with, I could actually, yes, you know. You could, you have. I could. Yes. Well, bottom line is the dumbing down of America, we're witnessing the, culture, the manifestation of a cultural abandonment where people literally 
are hyper fearful of a simple firearm. When I was growing up, everybody understood firearms as, as a standard tool. It's like a blowtorch or a steak knife or a jackhammer or a, or a chainsaw. And didn't you say you used to bring your uh, Oh, here's a, great, here's a great story. All right, yeah. This is, this is going to be the greatest Alex Jones story in the history of your program. You want that, don't you? Yes, we do. You need this. <laughs> so there I was. There I was in 1966 at St. Viders High School outside of Chicago. It's an all-boys Catholic academy. And I was in the Future Priest Club. Well, sure I was. It was just, <laughs> just before I wrote Wang Dang, Sweet Boon Dang. Um, so I'm in the Future Priest Club at the All Boys Catholic Academy, and we're going to the Future Priest Club weekend retreat. And we're gonna learn about Kyrie or Laison, and the blood is the wine, and the, the, the yes, thing is just, the body. Just and all this <laughs> voodoo stuff, which is, I was fat, I was- Stop. Stop. Just not paying any attention. I had a rock and roll band. I had the Amboy Dukes. We were kicking more ass than, than the Stones. So I'm going to the Future Priest Club retreat. And I go, well, I, I know where that is. There's a lot of woods over there. So I took my dad's 1187 12-gauge pump. It breaks down. It's an old World War II trench gun. And I put that 12-gauge in a box of six-shot in my little bag. And I went to the Future Priest Club retreat. When everybody else was going to the seminars, I put that son of a bitch together, loaded that up with number six shot, went out squirrel hunting every day. So here I am, um, an uppity individual, a rather spirited, almost, no, I take back the word almost, defiant young man. And I got a 12 gauge shotgun um, in a gun free zone outside of Chicago, shooting squirrels. Problems to society? Zero. All my buddies before opening day of gun season for the deer season all had their rifles and shotguns in their trucks, in, in some in school lockers. Problems in society? Zero. Access to firearms? 100% unlimited. School shootings? Zero. Now you have firearms more restricted, access to firearms more difficult today than ever in American history. And you have this because it's the dumbing down. It is the the brainwashing failure to teach our children what the Trail of Tears was. No kids know what the Trail of Tears was. Do anybody know what the Trail of Tears was? It was our version of the Bataan Death March. And nobody knows what the Rape of Nanking was, so that we don't believe that man could be so evil. Man can be so evil. You might want to check out the Auschwitz tapes. Um, so meanwhile, if you're denied the information of such abject evil, you can pretend that peace and love is the answer and that why can't we all just get along? That manifestation of cultural deprivation now steers the entire left agenda and it manifests itself in people being afraid of a simple pistol when in fact the simple pistol could save your family's life. The timing of every one of these shootings, if they were using a bird gun, with buckshot, they could have killed more people per shot fired than with any AR-15, because nobody's resisting. Three and a half inch triple out buck literally is a cinder block wall destroyer. You can be behind a cinder block wall and I can take five of these. The first two will take out the wall, the rest of them will cut you in half. Wow. These are what we use when we back up bear and, and lion hunters. These are three and a half inch magnum double lot bucks. And each round shoots over 30 pellets. So it's like every time I pull the trigger once with that round, it's 30 people shooting. 30 bullets come out of there. 30 rounds come out of this. So this is a standard AR-15 that Eugene Stoner invented in the 1950s. It's a semi-automatic sporting rifle. It is not a weapon of war. No society would be so irresponsible to send heroes of the military into war with a semi-automatic weapon. It is not an assault rifle, and it is not a weapon of war. It is a standard American family, modern sporting rifle that shoots one bullet per trigger pull. One trigger pull, one bullet. It shoots a 22 caliber bullet, and it's available everywhere because it's such an effective, wonderful home defense, hunting, uh, competition, family weekends. You know, families in America, millions of them every weekend, shoot their guns. Problems in society, is zero. Here goes a couple shots. So you can see it makes a little 22 caliber hole in the target.
And then you would have to ask an honest person, so you would feel okay if your kids were killed with a goose gun? Because you're afraid of an AR, because who can't get a goose gun or a pheasant gun or a dove gun? This is a goose gun, this is a duck gun, this is a pheasant gun. And loaded with standard ammunition that's available everywhere. The first fully automatic rifles uh, go back to the deck guns because they were shooting out a bunch of grape. I mean, that's what this is. This is the original, this is the original assault rifle. Well, again, my, my sheriff buddy showed me his pen the other day that if he wanted to, it would be an assault pen because I could assault you with it. So here's a standard sporting shotgun with double out buck that you can buy at any hardware store and any gun store, and you should, all around the world. In the, and by the way, this range right here is about what the shooters had to deal with because no one resisted. No one was trained how to fight back or how to deal with a shooter. So a shooter with a, with a goose gun could have done this. Fire in the hole, you clear? Good. It's really a walloper. Man, that sucker kicks. It's really a lot of power. And I know, I know this is just paper, but it'll show you the terminal ballistics of your standard firearms in America, your standard sporting shotguns that we hunt rabbits and pheasants and quail and doves and turkeys. And it's more deadly than an AR-15. This is one trigger squeeze of a 12-gauge shotgun with buckshot. If you really want to crush the left and want to crush freedom haters, not only should you be a member of the National Rifle Association, but you should give away memberships to everybody you know, at work and church and school, your family. The NRA should have 50 million members, because I know there's over 100 million gun owners in this country, and so far, five to six million NRA members are doing the heavy lifting for freedom. For, That's right, for the, rest the, of America. the giant's only half awake, and we're starting to win. Uh, and we've just got to get the giant fully awake and restore the republic. If people want to go to North Korea or Venezuela and, and, and live in hell, they can go. But here we're going to go back to what made the country great. When President Trump took the unprecedented, the most politically incorrect move I have ever seen from a politician, when he lifted the ban on trophies from Africa importation. What a hot button controversial issue to talk about political correctness. So he reauthorized the importation of African trophies because we all know that if you don't have trophy hunting dollars, there's no money for game wardens or radio telemetry or anti-poaching squads. So as soon as you ban a hunting area, the poachers take over because there's no money to stop the poachers. I mean, who doesn't know this stuff? Well, so but, president, but a lot of people don't know. This. Well, then we're, but the point is the president does know this. So he lifted the ban and none of the hunting organizations, organizations came up and stood up with him. So they had to rescind it. That's he good. did a bold, brave move. Then he had to rescind it because none of the people stood up for him. SCI, nothing. Ducks Unlimited, nothing. Fanaz, nothing. Rocky Mountain Elk, nothing. Wild Turkey, nothing. So we're starting our own organization called Hunter's Nation. And Donald Trump Jr. is one of our directors along Alongside me and a bunch of uh, Chris Colback and some great people. In fact, I'm going to put you on it. But Hunter Nation is going to pick up the slack. When the president does something good, if the people behind him don't rally, I'd like to thank them for nothing. It's it, it's in our hands. It's not just up to our elected well, I'm glad you're excited about this. to hammer these people. What you said, though, when there's not hunting and there's not conservation, like you said, then there's no regulations. Prince Bernhard who founded the World Wildlife Fund, got caught making zones in Kenya and all these other areas, no hunting, so he could control the poachers, and he got caught running billion-dollar operations uh, back in the 70s and 80s. Tell me, tell me you know about President Richard Lakey and how he got caught selling the ivory from his protected elephants. This is real important. Hunting, fishing, and trapping is perfect nature. If you don't hunt, fish, and trap, the wildlife overruns its carrying capacity of habitat, and they wipe it out, and it's been documented. Google Tsavo, T-S-A-V-O, in Kenya, and watch what happens when you ban hunting. The wildlife overpopulates, and it becomes a moonscape within years, and not just do the elephants die, but everything is gone. And then you got Scout County Park in Illinois, you got uh, Brown County Park in Indiana, where they do the same thing, you got the uh, Gettysburg 
park in Pennsylvania where they didn't allow hunting and there was nothing green. It was, it was a moonscape and the deer were tipping over with a thousand percent increase in highway deer accidents and human death. So the point is you have to balance the wildlife every natural season of harvest, Thanksgiving, to make room for next year's fawns and cubs and calves. If you don't know that, call 1-800-NUMNUT and Michael Moore will explain why you don't have to have personal hygiene. Hunting is perfect and every time you compromise it, it comes from people who hate nature and hate wildlife. And they were so, ignorant. And are, well, they're, they're, not, they're worse than ignorant. They know this. They just Well, it's also overgrazing. When you don't have hunting, it, it causes them to eat down to the uh, roots and then, and then it floods out. Sure. I was celebrating my 28th anniversary of the Ted Nugent Camp for Kids. It's a nonprofit 501c3 all-volunteer charity to teach kids about nature and to be clean and sober and put their heart and soul into being the best that they can be. The immediate zen of aim small, miss small marksmanship and the mystical flight of the arrow, hunting, fishing, trapping, woodsmanship, uh, planting trees, putting more back into nature than you take out. I mean, just beautiful, like Mother Teresa wishes she had a, a narrative that good. And I was celebrating on my Facebook, and of course, tens of millions, this is back when they, before the Facebook started cutting them off, we had like 36 million responses. And of the 36 million, like 35,991,000 were just wonderful teaching kids about nature and clean and sober and working hard and playing hard and being the best that you can be and putting more back into nature than you take out. And then somebody comes on and goes, you're an evil bastard. I hope your family dies of cancer for murdering defenseless animals. <laughs> well, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, that's beyond the cuckoo's nest. Rod Serling would have not taken that concept for, Ralford Hitchcock would have rejected the concept of that show. So there are evil, subhuman mongrels out there. You've got to know that. Ah, the neighbors are saying hello with small arms fire. I usually return with a salvo sal <laughs> myself. Um, so so I, I am not deterred. I, I, in fact, I'm more inspired now than I've ever been because I see that what I know to be truth, logic, and common sense is indeed universal in communities of spirit, heart, soul, and intellect, and education, and honesty, that that truth, logic, and common sense is spreading beautifully. And that's why the left and the fakers hate me, and I couldn't be more proud. Ted, a lot of historians, a lot of researchers say that you're almost like the first resurgence of 1776, going back to the late 60s and 70s, when you were doing things that are even called politically correct today, that, that you really kind of led the resurgence. I figure whatever you're gonna do, you might as well do it all the way, because if anything's worth getting into, it's, get, it's worth giving all your attention to and focusing on that given endeavor to the point where you can apply your energies and your capabilities to making sure that you maximize the potential of any given endeavor. And uh, I only do a few things in life, you know, I raise my children, I rock and roll, and I uh, hunt and I fish, and I uh, uh, like to go off in the mountains and stuff, four-wheel driving. And then people uh, you know, like uh, Charlton Heston helped, but uh, a lot of folks say you're patient zero, the left does, uh, going back 45, 50 years ago, reigniting uh, 1776 spirit. I agree. <laughs> I just wanted to play Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley music. I just wanted to practice my guitar and outdo the Ventures and Lonnie Mack and Dwayne Eddy. So I had bands in Detroit in the shadow of Motown. And when I was born in Detroit, everybody knows Detroit was the global epicenter of work ethic and productivity, neighborliness, goodwill, a work ethic that was unprecedented maybe in the history of our, our our species, except for maybe Glore in the year six when he finally got made fire. So I was in such a positive environment where America had proven to the globe that if you have freedom, you are more dedicated to good over evil, and that's how we defeated the Japs and the Nazis. And the whole world looked to America and went, boy, there's some bad motherfuckers, man. They climbed that Iwo Jima and they went to Boot Hill and they kicked ass on the maniac bonsais and the, the brainwashed Nazis. So the whole world looked to America 
and identified that what we were doing as an experiment in self-government with the Constitution, a Bill of Rights, and a Declaration of Independence might be something they might, they might want to look into. So my positive spirit was untouchable. I just wanted to play this new uppity soundtrack that the Emancipation Proclamation gave to Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and Little Richard to go ahead and express their musical dreams in defiance of all cultural controls of the time. I mean, Little Richard, are you kidding me? What? It, the punk's got nothing on Little Richard. I mean, here's a black gay guy singing about whacking your daughter, Tootie Fruity. I mean, what? A, you can't out punk Little Richard. So I'm talking about inspiring in defiance of of acceptable status quo music. My dad was a big Lawrence Walk fan. God bless him. So as I'm making my music and expressing myself in absolutism, never was I inhibited by any stretch of the imagination. And I started doing these interviews on radio stations when they started having rock and roll radio. And they'd always ask me where I get all this energy. A lot of people thought I was on some kind of drugs because of the energy that I was influenced by Little Richard and James Brown and the, my black heroes. And I went, no, I just had a great weekend with my dad up north. We were deer hunting. And the, the hippie disc jockey would go, you, you like kill deer, man? And I go, no, we eat them alive. <laughs> God, what kind of question is that? And I, I was... I, I hit this brick wall of insanity that I found someone who found fault with this perfect weekend with my family hunting deer. And now he's not just questioning it, he's angry. They're, get, they're condemning me for m murdering innocent animals. I'm going, are you kidding me? What are you talking about? And so just, I wasn't prepared in the world of debate, but I was prepared in the world of certainty that the weekend hunting deer with my dad was so perfect, how could you possibly find fault with this? And that's really where I got my energy. I wasn't even aware that there was a culture war coming from the beatniks, pre-hippies, and coming from a dope culture, a, a culture of comfortably numb... Well, it was communist. Denial, it was communism. Um, the community, it takes a, it takes a village. Um, we must form a commune. Uh, so anyhow, I'm not into this stuff. I'm into killing deer and hunting squirrels and catching bass and filleting them and putting them in the pan and hot oil, and they're still trying to spawn. I mean, I'm into the real world, hands-on conservation. And all of a sudden, then once in a while, I would turn a certain way, and they'd see my, my pistol print, and they'd discover I'm carrying a gun. they go, you got a gun? And they go, yeah, I got a handkerchief, too. I got a spare tire in my truck and a... In a fire extinguisher. So that was kind of the beginning of America being collapsed by the left and by the domestication, the brainwashing, but then you were kind of there at the beginning of it turning around, and now they see those tsunami waves coming in, and they're in these isolated bubbles of insanity, and they think by getting more insane and bullying more, we'll submit, but there's no putting the genie back in the bottle, and trying to suppress us is only making people seek us out that much more. I don't want to be a historian to know now, this is going to backfire them on big time. I, I don't know where leftism and globalism is going to be in 10 years as long as we stay coarse. Well, it certainly backfired on them when they tried to take me to task for doing what I knew was the right thing. And meanwhile, then they would start condemning me because I wouldn't snort their cocaine and I wouldn't smoke their dope because I had to get close to a white-tailed deer. And I guess if you're comfortably numb you'll, numb, you'll end up buying chicken. So I wanted to be cocked, locked, and ready to rock. And they're all dead by 70 and you look yes, like you're 50. Yes. So, so They're all dead by 70 and you look like you're 50. Well, I, I, I encountered... What but I, you look like you're a good-shaped 50-year-old. I, I mean, look at this guy. 70? 70 years old. Holy hell. I mean, that is just crazy. I, mean, I, did, uh, I didn't invent the middle finger, but I perfected it a long time ago. <laughs> um, so my point is is that I, I finally realized that I've, I've hit a brick wall of insanity. And I saw that it was a culture war and that they were against everything I believed in. And so I just, it inspired me to continue to stand up because I knew they were wrong. I told John Belushi was going to die after he laughed at me for not snorting his cocaine. I told Jimi Hendrix he was going to die after he laughed at me for not taking his, the pills. I laughed at Keith Moon. I, I, I said, you're going to die. And he laughed at me for not getting drunk. I, bon Scott laughed at me for not drinking his whiskey. And I told him, you're going to die. And I could go on and on. John Endless, liked, I told all these guys that were going to die. And they laughed at me and thought I was unhip because I carried a gun and I murdered innocent animals. What the? It's like insanity. So what they are is followers. They got controlled by the leftist and, and, and by these institutions that wanted to 
guild and emasculate America in the West. And so they all lined up so that they could be big stars. Uh, they all lined up and sold out. You didn't and were still successful. That is true Americana. That's Maverick. And I mean, uh, folks know you are one of the quintessential Mavericks. It's just true. Well, my dad was a drill sergeant in the U.S. Army Cavalry in World War II, and he never stopped. He brought his riding crop that he trained horses with home. I guess the Caddo Nine Tails. I mean, he never hit us with it. But boy, he let us know if we'd stepped out of line. I don't know if any of you remember the term, you better mind your P's and Q's or I'll knock your block off. Oh yeah. I mean, we need to, and it should be a curriculum, 12 through, I mean, K through 12. Key word, Alex, discipline. You make the right choice or you're gonna get punished. You paint the fence, you paint it perfect, or you're gonna paint it again. You earn your money delivering, you wanna buy a guitar? get a job. You want to buy an amp? Get another job. I worked my ass off since I was seven or eight years old selling night crawlers and painting fences and raking leaves and cutting lawns and shoveling snow and washing windows and I busted my ass. My dad said you're going to play guitar, we're going to set the timer and you're going to practice 30 minutes, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And I went, oh, what have I got myself into? But hallelujah, my dad disciplined us. My brother Jeff, CEO of numerous global pharmaceutical companies, my brother Johnny, the foreman of the Pepper Construction Company in Chicago, the biggest construction company in America. My sister Kathy, an embroidery goddess up in the woods of northern Michigan doing mail order and internet business. They worked their asses off. All seven of my kids worked their asses off. They're intellectual, they're athletic, they're fun, they're positive, they're loving and giving and really cock. They're alive. And they're very much like the left. And I don't say this to me. The left. When we go to all these rallies and things, they have all of them look like they're dying zombies, and it, it, they're it, like, "What the hell happened?" Well, I got to talk on that point. I'm going to say something that's going to be the most controversial thing ever. I've studied all the shootings, and I've studied all my haters. I've studied Antifa, and I've studied the left. In every instance where there's runaway crime, you know what you got? Dope got people who are high smoking dope and you know who doesn't know that they're so stupid from smoking dope people who smoke dope because your cape your sense of logic and even some of my close friends they get angry when I say that but if you're smoking dope you're in the liability column who do you want high your pilot how about your babysitter want your babysitter high how about your dentist how about your mechanic how about your landscape? Who do you want high? I'll tell you who I want high. Nobody! I want people tuned in. I want people in the asset column. I want people paying attention. The left, all Antifa, all the Occupy Wall Street, they've lost their souls because they, they, they pursue comfortably numb stoner lifestyles. And they're in the, they're in the liability column. I agree. I like people in the asset column. Well, if you want to be less than you can be, get high. If you want to be the best that you can be, stay straight. I've been clean and sober for 69.4 years. It works really good for me. I know a bunch of my friends who I wish I could jam with. Can't. Even the ones that are alive, can't. There's n medical marijuana or any, any thing that'll help someone with pain. I go through a lot of back pain and shoulder pain and I got a lot of two new knees, but I try to meditate and take away the pain with Shemaine and my dogs, and I do pretty good with that. But I do on occasion have to take tramadol. So I know that there are some pharmaceuticals and some herbs and, and, and earthly products that can take away pain and suffering, and I'm all for that. But when you do it to, to fade away, why, why would you want to fade away? Ted Nugent. We really know that you're back in the studio and you've given us so much time. I won't be able to you know, go to the shooting demonstration, but this has been amazing. Uh, but I don't want to impose you too much. So let's uh, get to what I really am begging for. Sure, what you, what you want is the soundtrack for freedom. That's my soundtrack. Yes. Yeah, hurry up.
Yeah, it's a very special time when you're making new music, too. Wow, so tell us about the new album. Well, it's called uh, The Music Made Me Do It. It's got great legs. <laughs> You bet. Glad to have you here, man. Awesome. Carry on. Keep raising hell. Remember, if you're not pissing off the asshole, you're an asshole. InfoWars Life Brain Force Plus is our number one selling product by leaps and bounds, and for a good reason. Going back about five years ago, we did research on what top selling nootropics were, what were most popular, what were best, what people liked, and we made it even stronger. Then we cut the price because leading competitors have five to seven times markup. We only have 150%, and then it helps fund our operation. Well, now it's 50% off. That means we've got a 25% markup, and we've got it paired with the real red pill that takes about seven days to kick in. Brain force takes about 30 minutes, but the two go together. It's the mind and body challenge. They're both 50% off individually, or together they're 50% off and free shipping with the combo at InfoWarsLife.com. But it's got to end in a couple days because both of these best sellers are about to sell out. InfoWarsLife.com to get your Brain Force Plus and Real Red Pill today.